Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Ask Rob Trick where I try to answer your questions from the comments sections of my videos and if you have any questions feel free to leave them down in the comments below of this video and I'll do my best to answer them. Today I got several questions and I'm going to try and start with some of the easier ones first and this one's from Neo Cosino. Hopefully I pronounced that right. Uh, but basically he has both the EM10 Mark II and the EM1 Mark II and he's programmed the FN1 button to uh, both be AF Aries Select. But on his EM10 Mark II, uh, when he rotates the top dials, the focus point moves around on the screen. But on his EM1 Mark II, the, the dials control the face detect and the uh, AF modes, like selecting single point, five point, uh, all points, etc. Uh, but what he wants to do is have the EM1 Mark II uh, have the dials set so that they move the focus point rather than changing the uh, focus modes and face detect. And uh, that's pretty easy to do. I'll be using my EM5 Mark III to uh, show you the settings, but they should be identical on the EM1 Mark II. All right, so I've done a full reset on the camera and I'm an aperture priority, not that the mode should matter. Uh, so first, let's just go into the menu and uh, go into the uh, custom menu and then go down here to button and button function. I'm just gonna program the ISO button to be the AF Aries select. So we'll just scroll down until we see that. There it is. Okay, so we'll click okay. So now when I push the ISO button, you can see that when I'm rotating the front dials, the face detect changes and the uh, AF points change, but it doesn't move the focus point. You have to use the D-pad, right? So all you have to do is go into the menu, then go into the autofocus menu and look for custom settings, which is right here. We'll go over there, click OK, and then you'll see two sets here, set one and set two. If we click over to the right, you can see set one is programmed by default to have the dials control the focus point and the face detect, or the focus mode and the face detect, and the D-pad is the sign to control the position. Uh, you can change that by just changing this to position, so now the front and rear dials control the position of the focus point as well as the D-pad. But you can change the D-pad to control the focus modes and face detect. Uh, so basically you're swapping these, right? So now when I push the uh, function button, I can rotate the front and rear dials and the focus point moves around. But if I want to change face detect, I can click left and right on the D-pad or up and down to change the focus uh, mode from single point to uh, small point to nine, etc. Now you do have some other options here. Let's go into the menu, go back to custom settings, and let's um, let's change this back to how it was originally, where we control the focus mode and face detect with the dials, and the D-pad controlled the position of the focus point. Now let's go into set two, and you'll notice there's a checkbox there. We can click on that. Let's go into set two, and now set two is the opposite of set one, right? We have the positions controlled by the dial, then we have the modes and face detect controlled by the D-pad. And we'll just click OK, and back out with the D-pad, tap the shutter button. All right, so now when I click the function button, uh, you'll notice that you're back to face detect and uh, focus mode with the dials and the D-pad controls the uh, position, right? But let me push the function button again. You can toggle by clicking the info button so that now the D-pad or the dials control the position and the D-pad controls face detect and focus mode. And I can toggle again with the info button and swap those settings. So this might be a little confusing uh, if you set up both set one and set two. So I probably, I would recommend just set up set one, turn off set two, and just set up set one the way that you like to use it, like so. And that's how I would set it. So now when I click the function button, I can move the focus point around, then toggle if I want single point or multi-point with the D-pad. 
All right, the next question here is from Ned McFadden, and uh, this is about the EM1 Mark II as well. And it says, why do I have ISO 6400 limit when doing video mode, and I can't figure out how to go higher like I can in manual mode, that's a, a photo mode. And also, how do you get exposure meter in video mode? There's a histogram, but I like to spot meter on the subject when setting exposure. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so unfortunately, the limit in video is ISO 6400. And if you're using auto ISO in uh, any photo mode, your limit is set to 6400. I, I've asked Olympus not to do that. You know, just let us set whatever ISO we want, but they have capped it uh, to 6400 in both cases. Uh, now, you're also asking about uh, spot metering in video mode. And uh, unfortunately, there's no direct way to do that. When you're in video mode, you're stuck with that uh, matrix metering or ESP mode where it just kind of averages the scene. However, uh, using the histogram, you can actually spot meter uh, your subject. It's a little awkward, but maybe it'll work for you. So I'll show you how to do it. All right, so as you can see, I'm in movie mode and uh, I'm actually shooting in full manual mode as indicated by the letter M over on the right. And uh, let's just point up here to the, uh, the wider area of the wall here. And if I click the OK button to go in the Super Control Panel, I can toggle between the Super Control Panel and click the Info button, and it goes to this uh, Live Control Panel. And uh, as you can see in the Live Control Panel, I'm in Manual Mode, Continuous AF. But let me toggle back to the Super Control Panel. And I'm just going to set the uh, focus point to the center, uh, just because when I do that, you can see there's a little uh, framing there in the center where the focus point is. And if you look at the histogram below that, you, you'll see the white area there, which shows you the overall exposure of the scene. But in the center there to the right, you'll see a green area. That green area represents the center of the frame. So it's, it's almost like a spot meter. So as you can see, uh, right now the green area is slightly uh, uh, above middle gray. And if I want to bring that white wall you know, to be middle gray, I would just have to adjust my exposure. So I would just uh, maybe just increase my aperture. So now I'm at middle gray. Right, let's go back. Let's do a little more extreme example. Notice when I move the uh, uh, framing over to the uh, my hat, you'll see that that green spot uh, in the histogram has moved all the way over to the left because my hat's very, very dark versus uh, the uh, door here, right? So I'll go back to my hat. And if I wanted to expose for my hat, for example, you know, regardless of what else is in the scene. Um, in this case, I'd have to probably just increase ISO because I don't want to change my shutter and my aperture is already wide open. So I'll go into the ISO and I'm just going to increase this. Unfortunately, I can't see exactly what's happening, but I'm just, I'm going to just put this up to say 6400. Now let's move the uh, framing over my hat and yeah, now you can see that the green area is just a little bit above middle gray, so I can back off my ISO just a little bit, check it again. And now that green area is pretty much right on middle gray. So now I've exposed for my hat and not the rest of the scene, obviously, right? It's overexposed. So that, that's a little bit of an extreme example, but hopefully that gives you an idea of, you know, it's kind of a workaround to spot metering. And unlike when you're in a photo mode, that little uh, focus point, when you move it around, the spot meter doesn't follow the focus point around. They're not linked. The, uh, and when you're in video mode, that spot metering is always in the center. Uh, it doesn't move around with the focus point. So just also keep that in mind. All right, the uh, next question here is from Burnt Lie, and he says, I've set up the OM-1 with the indication of the over and under exposure for the, the red and blue colors that you can see when something's uh, starting the clip, either in the highlights or in the shadows. And uh, he uses exposure compensation to uh, reduce the burnouts, meaning I assume you mean not clip the highlights. Uh, you want to capture as much of the uh, highlights as you can or information. And for subjects, if I reduce exposure to avoid burning out parts of the subject, uh, e.g. sunlight and clouds, the main elements of the subject become very dark. 
Uh, is it better to burn out the parts of the image with less importance than to make the key parts overly dark? Is there any rule of thumb I can safely underexpose the main part of the picture? So I'm gonna make an assumption here that you're gonna be shooting in RAW and post-processing because if you're shooting in JPEG, there's just not enough latitude in the file to uh, recover highlights and shadows. So you're gonna to have to pick one. Either you want color and detail in your highlights or do you want color and detail in your shadows? It'd be very difficult to get both. However, with raw processing, and if you're gonna be using the highlight and shadows and not bracketing, uh, then my rule of thumb is plus or minus one stop to get the most amount of detail in the highlights and shadows. And then from there, you're gonna to have to make a subjective decision. Do you wanna to start to lose high, uh, detail and color in your highlights, or do you wanna to start to get noise and grain in your shadows? Um, so let me try and demo that for you. Uh, here in my studio the best I can of what what you can do when you're in the field all right let's say I want to take a picture of this rose and you can see that the background is already starting to clip and what I want to do is expose to the right as much as possible uh, to the point that I think I can still recover the highlights in post-processing so what I do is I'm gonna dial in a little negative exposure comp until I don't see any more clipping in the highlights assuming I want to recover all of the highlights so there's a third, one more click. So looks like negative two thirds of a stop uh, safely recovers all of the highlights. Now I can go one stop over this and I should be able to recover the highlights. So we'll go three clicks up so I can go to plus a third EV and I should be able to recover that in post-processing even though it's clipped here in the display. So let's take a picture there and bring that into the uh, software. All right, here's the raw image. Let's turn on the highlight or clipping indicators. And you can see, just like we saw on the camera, all of this is uh, clipped out completely. And uh, let's go ahead and I'm gonna just do a local adjustment here and see if I can bring those back in. Yeah, no problem. Just like that. And, uh, and then I'll just push the uh, midtones and shadows a little bit for the uh, flowers. But let's punch in, and now you can see that I had some, uh, this is a piece of paper with some text on it. You can see I was able to bring back all of the details here in the paper. And if we look at the before, in this image, uh, before we did the editing, it's completely clipped out. And after, I was able to bring in everything. And you can even see the outline of the paper here. Uh, it's I mean, it's out of focus, but... Uh, you get the idea. So I may have been able to dial in another third of a stop uh, and still recovered all of the highlights, but rule of thumb, plus or minus one stop. So basically, uh, look at the scene. If there's anything blinking in red, dial in negative exposure comp until you don't see anything in red. And then from there, you can dial in plus a full stop uh, of exposure comp and know that you'll be able to safely recover all of the highlights. And the same thing applies to the shadows. Uh, basically, you dial in positive exposure comp until you don't see anything in the blue. And then from there, you can back off a full stop in the negative direction uh, and know that you can safely recover those shadows without any noise and grain. And that's without consideration for any kind of denoising software you might have, like Deep Prime or Topaz, etc. Uh, but that's all I have time for today. I have a lot more questions I have to get to, so I'll be making some more videos soon. So be sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss those. And if you found this video helpful, consider buying me a coffee or making a donation in the links below. They're greatly appreciated. And I appreciate you watching, and I hope to see you again soon.